Jesus' name, amen. Once again, good morning. I pray that uh, we have a wonderful week this week. We are looking, uh, obviously, uh, this would be Palm Sunday. Um, next week we celebrate uh, the true reason, um, and that is uh, the risen Savior. Had Jesus simply died and that was it, he'd have been just like the rest of the prophets, the rest of the uh, so-called leaders of different uh, uh, religions, but our Savior rose, and that is so important for us to remember that. I want to real quick uh, give a little bit of information. Frank and Jean Ann Baker, they're the Swedes that sit right down here, such a precious couple. Um, she is still in the hospital. Um, she had a, a surgery uh, a couple of days ago and then turned right around three days uh, later. On the third day, she had to have a, a second major surgery. Um, she is uh, still going to be in the hospital for quite a while, but would appreciate prayers for her and then also for Frank. Um, the cancer that he has uh, is in his lymph nodes uh, within his lungs, and so we just need to remember, remember that, that couple. Also, uh, would appreciate continued prayers for my bride as she's still struggling with the, the, the implant and everything else with the, with the cochlear ear, and it's just... Uh, it's been really tough, so I know that she would appreciate those prayers. Then I would like to acknowledge somebody that as we think about the longevity of life and how beautiful it is to celebrate uh, someone turning 95 and, and, and just a beautiful thing. You know, this church has been blessed for so many years with a, a faithful, faithful person. And Miss Tooby has been so faithful here at our church and, and has sat here on this piano for many a year. And, and, you know, we are blessed by, by her and just all that she does. And I just want to say from this pulpit to you how much I appreciate and thank you and for all that you have done for these years. And um, just truly, truly thankful. A lot of changes, and she just goes right along and, and takes it in stride and keeps it going. And what a blessing that is, and, and truly thankful for her. I'm going to tell you there are a lot of things that... Uh, that we talk about from this pulpit, but this morning there's going to be one. This is going to be one that, that we really need to take very seriously. A lot of people don't understand <clears throat> the idea of atonement. It's not a word that we use a lot, it is more of a theological word. Um, so, a lot of people look at atonement and kind of go, well, I'm not real sure what that means. So, this morning we're going to cover this idea of atonement, this, this, this work of atonement. Um, and this is what Christ has done for us. It is, it is the work that he has done. So if you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And I know you all been standing, but uh, if you're visiting with us today, we are a church that believes getting your exercise in really, really good on a Sunday. So let's stand together and let's read God's word. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I have handed down to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Father, we thank you for the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for uh, the fact that he took our cross, our punishment, our pain, and our guilt upon himself. And he took that guilt to the grave, and he overcame it, and he rose again, so that we might find atonement in him. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. The idea of atonement, we need to look at the word atone. It means to cover. Uh, the, it became kind of the idea in the Old Testament to take away. So you, you're covering something when you're, when you're going to atone something. You're taking uh, something away. And, and, and so the idea here is that uh, we do this on a regular basis. How many of you have ever gone out to eat with someone and uh, instead of splitting the check, you said, I will cover the bill, right? You said, I will cover the bill. I will take care of that. 
All right, so uh, how many of you have ever been blessed by someone else paying your bill? Just raise your hand real quick. If you've ever been blessed by, right, most of us in this room, someone has covered your bill. Now, let me explain this to you. Everybody in here should have raised their hand because you had parents, right? <laughs> Everybody in this room should have raised their hand because you had parents. Somebody covered your bill, and you're like, well, yeah, but they had to. No, they did not. No, they did not. I was taught that lesson as a teenager, <laughs> okay? Still living at home, right? You want to do that? Great. Go work, okay? But we have this great, beautiful thing, and, and we've, we've, we have this opportunity to take and, and do something for someone. So we have said to someone, I will cover the bill. Now, this does not mean that the debt will be merely covered or hidden or swept under the rug, but that it will be paid and the obligation then is removed, Okay? So atonement is this idea <clears throat> that Christ didn't just go to the cross in order for us to find uh, that our sins have been covered. No, they have been taken away when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. They have been removed from us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. The guilt that is due us is, is taken away when we go to Christ. Now, this obligation being removed, we also then have something in our own lives that is very important. We need sin to be removed, right? If you're a sinner, I want you to say, I. I. But did you, now, I love it. Can I tell you why I love it? Did you hear the, the little kids understand that they're a sinner? Yeah. Do you know how beautiful that is for a child to understand that they are guilty? Because, by the way, that's what a sinner is. They're guilty, right? They have broken a law. How many in this room this morning on the way to church broke the law? Okay, Jason raised his hand. There you go. <laughs> some of y'all, some of y'all sped. Um, a lot of us break the law once, right as we get to church. I'm going to explain to you how we do it, okay? How many of you do the old California roll at the stop sign, <laughs> Right? You kind of roll up to the stop sign and you go, there ain't nobody coming, <laughs> right? You just kind of zoom right on through because the stop actually is a suggestion, right? I mean, it, it's, <clears throat> how many of you remember when you were younger and I don't, and I do not ask you to do this, but I remember when I was younger, my dad would drive up to the stop sign and he would yell first, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that gave him authority to just kind of be the next one in line. I don't know what that meant, but. We've all broken rules. We've all been guilty. We, we find ourselves guilty. If you've ever been arrested, you know what that guilt feels like. You know all of a sudden you have the weight of the world, the weight of your family upon you. Everything becomes heavy because you have been caught. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, everyone in this room has been caught. We have all been found guilty. So we need this stain. We need this thing removed from us. Jeremiah 2.22 says, although you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is before me, declares the Lord. Donna Colbeck, she, is a, uh, she has the ability to do things uh, with the stain in your clothing. I once had a stain, and I, I said, I was complaining about it. She said, well, can you bring me what you got? I said, well, it's like oil, and all this other stuff is one of my favorite shirts. She said, just bring it here. She takes it home, and I don't know what she does, but she puts all this different stuff. I'm sure she lets it soak. She does whatever. She brings me the shirt back, and I'm like, this isn't my shirt. She's like, no, the stain's gone. Because I remember what I, what I handed to her. I remember what it looked like. And in my mind, there was no way that she would ever get that stain out. She was able to just remove it. I don't know how she did it. I'm sure it took some scrubbing and some this, that, and another. And then she's got these little things in her mind. So, so listen, Donna, if you want to make a little extra money, <laughs> okay, y'all need some stains removed. You know who to go to now. But unfortunately for us, when it comes to sin, you, there is no secret to getting it out. There, there's not some way that you and I can, can kind of do something a little different we, that, that would take away the, the stain of sin in our life. Romans 4, 7 says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. 
and whose sins have been covered. If you're here this morning and you are born again, you understand the idea of atonement. You have been covered by something. Something has happened in your life that that has covered your sin and taken it away. It has been removed as only God can. But I want us to look at something this morning, and I want us to look at where this started. It started back in the Old Testament, Leviticus 17, 11. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, okay? So we're talking here about what runs through our veins. The idea is for us to focus here upon the life of the blood, the blood that supplies us, the blood that gives us life that is pumped through our body. If you lose too much blood, what happens? You die, correct? For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. In other words, at some point, blood must be shed upon the altar to take care of the sins of the people. This is something that God had put in place and into practice, and what had to happen In order for your sins to be forgiven, you had to take the very best of your flock and sacrifice it. And here's the other part. Now, some of you you children might get a little upset about this, but it's okay. You can handle this because you need to know. A lot of times, the very animal that was sacrificed would have been kept in the house. And those children would have to watch that animal's life be taken. When Christ said that blood had to be shed, it wasn't just any blood. It had to be the most favorite, the absolute best animal you had. Why do you think that was? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted you to know how expensive sin is in our life. He wanted us to understand how expensive sin is in our lives. Leviticus 16, this is the Old Testament way of dealing with sin. Leviticus 16, verse 27 says, But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be taken outside the camp, and they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse in the fire. Then the one who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water, and afterward he shall come into to the camp. <clears throat> so these animals that were used as sacrifices had to then be taken out of the camp, and they had to be burned completely. And then the gentleman that was there doing that job would have had the stench of their burned flesh upon his clothing and upon his the blood upon his body. So he would then have to go and wash his clothing and then wash his body, then he would be considered clean, and he could then come in and join the festivities. So by handling the sin, he himself became dirty. You know how many of us become dirty when we try to handle sin? Do you understand what it takes whenever sin's in our life, and in our mind we go, oh, I can, I can get out of this, I can do this. No, no, the only way to deal with sin is to repent and confess, God, I am a sinner, and this is my struggle. Now, we, we keep reading here in verse 29, it says, this shall be a permanent uh, statute for you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble yourselves and do, uh, not do any work. Whether the native or the stranger who resides among you, for it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So the Old Testament way was you had to go get a goat, the best goat you had, possibly a sheep. And then also we're talking about uh, a calf, a bull calf. Now, they had to be the best of the flock. They had to be the ones that the family loved. I'm telling you, this is... you. you You didn't want to give up your best, but you had to. And then the blood would be taken. That then would be the price paid for the sins of the people. But God had a different plan. 
God had a plan that would eventually bring us all to a place where once for all, Christ would die. So the New Testament way we find in Romans chapter 5, verse 11. And not only this, but we also celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You and I are guilty. And a guilty person cannot come into the presence of God. So we have a problem, agreed? Because where do we want to be? We want to be with God. We want to be in his presence. Whenever we die, where do we want to be? We want to be with the Father, the one who created us. But we can't because no one guilty can come into the presence of the Father. So what does Jesus do for us? Jesus takes his position that he has in heaven where he is worshipped by angels and he sets it aside in obedience to the Father. He comes to earth where he is no longer worshipped. But he takes a position. What position does Christ take when he comes here? A servant. Folks, servants were thought one step higher than scum. Slaves, servants, they weren't thought of. They, they, they were kind of the, they just have to be here. They're, they're the ones who wash our feet. They're the ones who fix the dinner. They're the ones who clean up around here. They're the ones who feed the sheep. They were, they were not really considered much in society. And so Jesus comes as the lowliest. He comes as a servant. He humbles himself. You and I have been found guilty. We've talked about this so much in our church that we know it. A child does not have to be taught how to be bad, correct? No, I'm like, I'm seriously, a child does not have to be taught how to be bad. It is very what? Natural. Very, very natural. A child knows how to throw a fit. A child knows how to kick their feet. A child knows when they get teeth how to bite one another. Right? It's what they do. A child knows that if you take away my toy, that was my toy. And now it's time to do what? It's time to get it on. We're fixing it. We're gonna, we might as well put the ring up, right? We're going to do this MMA style. It's free. Whatever it takes, we're going to get that toy back. Nowadays, kids aren't quite as aggressive as we were when we were little. Like, I'd have jumped off the top rope on you if you'd taken something that was mine, right? <laughs> Nowadays, kids go back, Mama, he stole my toy. Mamas, tell your kids to go back and take the toy. <laughs> Teach kids to be kids again and how to be tough. Man, sometimes, some of y'all are so shocked when kids are actually kids. I can't believe they did that. Well, they're kids. Good grief. What did you think they were going to be, 30 years old in a body that size? No, people are going to be calling for my resignation. I can't believe you're telling kids they ought to fight. I'd rather them fight than whine. Good grief, it drives me crazy. <laughs> Man, a lot. It drives me bananas. Two boys fight, they get over it. They're friends afterwards, normally. Two girls fight, they never get over it. They never talk to each other again. <laughs> That's just the way that works. We're not equal. You just heard that. We can get over it. Y'all can't. <laughs> Moving on. Brother Tom, you're really on thin ice today. Yes, I am. And I'm on thin ice because I want you to realize how thin your ice is if you think you're good enough to make it to heaven. We have to come to a place where we understand that sin is natural for us. Righteousness is imputed because it's not natural. It is given to us by the work of Christ. Hebrews 9, and I love this. I'm, I'm going to try to, to get through this because it's a lot, but I want you to stay with me. Hebrews 9, if you ever want to know what atonement looks like, if you want to know what it looks like to go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, Hebrews 9 is the answer. Okay, 
Verse 1 says, even the first covenant had regulations for divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was equipped, the outer sanctuary in which are the lampstands, the table, and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the most holy place, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which a golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's staff which budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the atoning cover. But about these things we cannot now speak in detail. Why? Because it's in the past. They're, they're gone. Those things are no longer in Israel. They're, they're out. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience." Since they relate only to food, drink, and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until time of reformation. It was a constant process, folks, of having to atone, constant process of having to sacrifice, a constant process of having to come back to the altar and say, God, forgive me of this and forgive me of that. And Lord, I need you to forgive me for this again. And I need you to forgive me for that again, God. And, and just constant sacrifice. Verse 11 says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things having come, he entered through the great and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands, that is, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify, uh, sanct sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh... How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the violations that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a covenant... There must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when people are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. Do you understand why we say this, is, this blood is the new covenant? Jesus' blood is the new covenant because it is the last covenant. It is the final covenant. Verse 22 says, and almost all things are cleansed with blood according to the law. And without the shedding of blood, there is no what? Forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made by hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters a holy place year by year with blood that is not his own, otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been revealed to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is destined for people to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin in those who eagerly await him.
Folks, I don't know about you, but that is a beautiful picture of what has happened from the Old to the New Testament. The Old Testament was constant sacrifices, constantly having to take and, and, and confess your sin because once again, it was that time of year for everybody to go in and be forgiven. Once a year, you had to wait. And you know what? If the priest was not right with God, you know what happened to the priest when he went into the holy place? He died. They tied a rope onto this priest so that if he was not right with God, you know what they could do? They could drag him out because he'd have been dead. And guess what? They'd have had to wait another year for atonement. So Christ comes once for all he died. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says this, and when you were dead in your wrongdoings are your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certain Certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Did you, did you hear that? God was against you. You say, no, God was for me. No, folks, because of your sin, we were enemies of God. He desired to reconcile. He desired to make us right. This is why forgiveness is so important. And I'm not talking about the forgiveness that Christ brings us. I'm talking about when we forgive others. We are showing the work of Jesus Christ. Are you here today and in your heart you have this unforgiving spirit? We talked about this Wednesday night. It, it is so tough. But folks, an unforgiving spirit leads to sin. If we have been born again, we should be able to forgive people even when they hurt us. Now, forgiving someone does not mean that I'm going to put all my faith and trust in them again. I'll be guarded. I'll be guarded. But it doesn't mean I'm going to hold it against them. You want to know how you can truly know if you forgive somebody? Can you serve that person? Can you love them? Because that's what Jesus did the night that he was betrayed. He even washed Judas' feet. If you read the account, you find that Judas was sitting probably at the right hand at the table, which is a place of honor. He put the man who betrayed him in a place of honor because he was the first one to dip his bread into the cup. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our wrongdoings, having canceled the, certific the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Can you say amen? amen. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He made a public display when Christ showed himself for 40 days. They killed him, but he's alive. They buried him, but he's risen. Do you abide in the atonement? Do you receive what Christ has done for you once for all? Are you forgiven? This week I spoke to a gentleman at a funeral. And I asked, I said, how are things going? And he said, well, I'll be honest with you, it's been kind of tough. He said, I've been going to the priest a lot here lately. I just asked him, I said, man, why do you keep going to the priest? I just got a lot of things. I gotta, I, I've been really just really messing up lately. I've been going to the priest trying to get myself right. And I looked at him. I said, you know, the Bible says that Jesus gave us these instructions. Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. 
I said, you can go to the priest all you want to, but the priest can't help you. He said, I can't even help you. All I can do is point you in the right direction. <laughs> Folks, if you want to abide in the atonement, don't come to me and start confessing your sin. I don't need to know what all you've got going in your life. I don't need to know the things you failed in. I don't need to know all the sins you struggle with. But I can tell you something. I can point you to the person who can handle it for you. And that person is Jesus Christ. Amen. So, if you're here this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have put it in man, you have put it in trying to be a good church member, you've put it in trying to be a changed person. And, 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 and you know how to tell if, this is, if, if it's in your own strength? You have to keep doing it over and over and over again. The Bible says that Jesus died once. If you're trying to save yourself, if you're trying to get better yourself, you're the hot and cold type. You, you'll be in church for a while and then you step back because you've got other things that are more important. Can I tell you something? You know how guilty I've been of that in my own life? You say, well, you're the pastor. You're always here. Folks, I might be here, but there's a lot of times I'm checked out. Like, I wish I could tell you that was not true, but I have struggled with that in my own life. That I have been here physically but spiritually, I was far away somewhere else. There are a lot of times even the preacher tries to work in his own flesh, and it ends miserably. Come today. Come today and say, God, I abide in the work of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, this morning we come and we confess to you the need that we have to trust in the work of your son. When we sing the song that he paid it all, we believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that he paid it all. Father, we struggle because there are often times that we think we can do things on our own. We don't want to bother you because we can handle this. And the truth is we just get ourselves in deeper trouble. So, Lord God, deal with our hearts. God, change us from the inside out. As we're going to sing here in just a moment, Father, give us Jesus. Give us what we need today, which is your son. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand together.